Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Neighbor, a conversation about how the most tangible expression of our love for God is our love for our neighbor. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's pretty cool that this conversation about how the most tangible expression of our love for God is our love for our neighbor overlaps with the Christmas season. Right? I love that it overlaps with the Christmas season because at the end of the day, the Christmas season is a celebration of the day that God became our neighbor. Amen? Anybody? I don't know if you ever thought about it that way, but Christmas is a celebration of the day that Jesus became your neighborhood. It's the day that Jesus moved into the neighborhood. Shout out to Eugene Peterson for such a vivid and clutch uh, imagery of the Christmas story. Let me just show it to you real quick so you don't think I'm making this up. John chapter 1, verse 14, message paraphrase. Listen to what he says here. It says, the word, which the word is Jesus, became flesh. Right? That's Christmas, right? That's God coming in person in flesh. He says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into, say with me, the neighborhood. neighborhood. Right? If you're online, type it in the comment. The word moved in the neighborhood. We saw his glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. The writer says the word, Jesus, moved in to the neighborhood. A couple months ago, I drove by a neighborhood that I lived in when I was in college because I wanted to take a picture for the gram, um, but it never happened. <laughs> and the reason it never happened is because I never stopped. Right? I drove by, but I was too scared to stop to take a selfie with the house I lived in. And the reason I was too scared is because driving by, all of a sudden, I remembered what it was like to live in that neighborhood for five years. Right? I remember, literally, some of you have heard me share this story before, living in that house, and we got robbed, and a guy pointing a shotgun at my face and saying, you better give me all of your money and all of your weed, and I'm like, I don't have any money, I don't have any weed, but just give me a second and I'll pray that maybe God will magically make money and weed appear so you don't shoot me. I remember being in that situation. I remember one time we had just come home from Christmas break. All of us had just come back into the house and we just moved. Everything was in boxes and we went to go watch a movie here at the mall. And I remember we all came back, me and all six of my roommates, and somebody had broken in and they had taken all of our stuff. And it was perfect because they were still in boxes from Christmas. And they're like, this is so nice. This is the easiest robbery that we've ever had in our entire life. I remember people would come over to the guy's house. I remember uh, my wife, girlfriend back then would come over to the guy's house and we would tell our guests, leave your car open. Okay, we got cars robbed and jacked so many times that we would tell people, hey, if you come over, just leave your car open because it's easier for them to rob you that way. If you don't want them to smash your window, just leave it open and they're going to go in and search for stuff. You know, that's just normal in this neighborhood. I remember every single year we lived there for about five to six years. I remember we would go sign the lease year after year and all of our friends and family would be like, are you sure? <laughs> they're like, are you sure you want to sign a lease? To spend another year in the house where you got robbed at gunpoint. Are you sure? I know it's close to campus, and I know you guys got some sentimental things in there about it, and you've been there for a while, but there are other neighborhoods in the city of Toledo. Are you sure that you want to sign this lease? And every year for five to six years, we say, yeah, we want to sign a lease to live in this neighborhood. Now, leave your cars open so it's easier for our neighbors to rob you, right? <laughs> the writer says that Jesus moved in the neighborhood. Okay, I know that I'm not going to probably say anything this morning that you're not super familiar with, and there's probably not going to be any spoiler, shock, or I didn't see that coming plot twist in today's conversation, but can it not be lost on us that the writers and eyewitness account and historical account claim that 2,000 years ago, Jesus not only moved into the neighborhood, but he decided to sign a lease in the shadiest neighborhood that you could ever imagine. Right? Can, can that not be lost on us? That of all the places that Jesus could have moved into, he decided that I'm going to go to the last place anybody expects me to move into. And can it not be lost on us also that after Jesus moved it or when Jesus moved it, unlike my friends and my family, that they were, they were excited for Jesus to move in. Right? The father, Jesus' father and all the people who were helping him, they were so excited 
for Jesus to move into the neighborhood that he moved into, specifically where he was born. And the reason they were excited is because they knew that the moment he moved in, not only would that neighborhood change forever, but all the neighbors would change forever. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to spend a good chunk of our time today. Uh, Jim kind of stole my thunder in the huddle before service. And so I'm like, let it pivot to another certain. No, just kidding. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2 later this week, Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock. We're going to look at the first seven verses of Luke chapter 2. We're going to talk about joy. Please don't miss it. I promise you it's going to be phenomenal. But check out what the writer says. We're going to start in verse 8. Okay, so what's happening in here is that Jesus is about to move into the neighborhood. And the angels are unloading the U-Haul truck. And one of the neighbors saw it and went over. You know, there's always that nosy neighbor that's like, so who's moving in? What's going on in here? You know, and the angel's like, okay, let me tell you who's moving in, and that's where we jump in here. Luke chapter 8, listen to what the writer says. He says, and there were sheep boys living out in the fields. <laughs> if you know, you know. If not, go watch last week's sermon on the YouTube, okay? I kind of trademarked that, by the way. I was going to look up sheepboys.com. I don't know. I just kind of <laughs> bookmarked that for something, so. Anyway, so the writer says there were, there were these sheep boys, these shepherds, they were out in the field. They're keeping watch over the flocks at night. And so these guys are just at work doing their thing. They're doing their sheep thing at work, right? It's, it's, it's third shift or late shift, you know, in the middle of their shift. One guy just took a smoke break, and he's just coming back. He's like, man, it's been a great night. It's a normal night. There's not a whole lot that happens when you're a shepherd. You're just kind of out in the field watching sheep. It's basically the same thing every single night, except for this night something happened that doesn't normally happen. The writer says, that as they were out there keeping watch over the flock at night, doing their nine to five job, if you will, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And he says, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And I love the response. He's like, man, and they were so excited. It was like they just saw an old college buddy. They're like, what's up? What's going on, angel, man? This is amazing. Come on right in, man. Take a seat. Wow, look at that. Ain't this something? This is incredible. Bucky, come over here. Come over here. The sheep are fine. I promise. Come over here. We've just been visited by an angel. How amazing is this? I can't believe it. Can you believe it? Can you believe that an angel just showed up? This is amazing. Now, can you believe that we're about to take a selfie? Can we take a selfie, Mr. <laughs> angel, with you? Right, because you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to go back home, and you're going to tell your boys that you saw an angel, and they're going to say, pics, or it didn't happen. And so you're like, but it did happen, and so I need the receipts. This is going to go viral on Instagram. This is great. Can we, can we take a selfie, Mr. Angel, just for a little bit? It's not very professional. We know, but this doesn't happen very often. No, no, no. <laughs> the writer says that they were what? Terrified. Okay, sorry, not sorry to ruin the manger scene for you even more than I did last week. But FYI, the angel in the Christmas story is not just background aesthetics. Right, you know how we have the manger scene and the angels just kind of float in the background. Like, I'm just going to provide a nice spiritual glow over what's happening. No, 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 no. No, the angel was an unforgettable part of the story. Right, and we know that because when these Sheep boys, the shepherds saw him. The writer says that they were filled with terror. Okay, so imagine seeing something that terrifies you. They were terrified because they had never seen that kind of majestic presence before. They were terrified because this wasn't like the chubby little guy with a harp that they saw in Sunday school or in cartoons growing up. No, no. This was a majestic being that was more glorious than they could ever imagine. And I think the angel could tell that they were terrified because listen to the first thing he says to them. He says, don't be afraid. He's like, come back, Bucky. Bucky's gone. He's over the fence and he's out. He's like, dude, come back. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, bro. Come on. I know that I'm not what you're expecting. I know that you're not used to seeing this kind of presence in your neighborhood, but don't be afraid. He says, I come with what good news. He says, I bring you good news. And then he says this, that will cause great joy for all the people. And we're going to talk about that on Christmas Eve. Then he says this in verse 11. He said, today. Somebody say today. 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 Type in the comments today if you're watching. Like Today, he said. Woo! I mean, can you imagine being in that moment? Okay, imagine being a part of a people that have waited 
400 years for the promise. I mean, 400, that's a long time. Right? I'm looking at Jim. Jim's old. He's not 400 years old. <laughs> Can you imagine how long that was? Several years ago, my wife and I made maybe one of our worst parenting mistakes. We told our kids that we're taking them to Disney in four weeks. Worst mistake ever. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because guess what they did every day? Is it today? Are we going to Disney? They're like, no. I just told you five minutes ago that it's in four weeks, you know. Every single day. Is it today? Are we going to Disney today? Is it today? Is it today? Can we pack our bags? Is it today? Are we going to the airport today? Every single day. And I told my wife, I'm like, never again. Like, we are literally going to tell them five minutes before we leave the next time. I'm like, guess what? We're, we're going to leave in five minutes, right? <laughs> but I'll never forget the look on their face. We're like, today. And they're like, Woo! <laughs> Like, I was waiting for them to ask me. I was like, come on, I know you're going to ask. Sure enough, they're like, is it today? I'm like, it is today. For 400 years, people had been waiting for the promised Messiah. And all of a sudden, the angel rolls in, and these, and these shepherds are like, what's going on? And he's like, don't be afraid. I got good news for you. He says what? Today. It's happening today. Not tomorrow. Not next week. You don't got to wait another 40 years. No, it is today, he says, in the town of David. Okay, so you know that part, the neighborhood, everyone drives around and you lock your windows and, you know, lock your cars and roll up the windows, you know, and you're not going to stop to take a selfie, right? The shady part of town, the hood. Today, in the hood is what he's saying here. Something amazing just happened. A Savior has been born to you. And you will find him, he says. You will find a baby in a golden diaper wrapped in cloths, laying in a manger. I want to read a word to you that jumped out of me a couple days ago that I hadn't noticed before. And see if you can figure out why I think it's so significant. He says, today, a Savior has been born. He's the Messiah. Messiah. This is a sign to you. And then he says, you. Just think about that. You. Okay, let's back up and think about who's you in this story. It's not a trick question. Who's you? Anybody? Someone whispered it over here. Say confident. The shepherds. Right? The sheep boys. <laughs> you. A little historical context. The shepherds in the first century, outcasts. Literally. Last on the totem pole. Literally the last people to find out if anything amazing was happening in town. That's part of why they were out in the fields. They didn't have social media or smartphones or internet back in the day. And so if anything amazing was happening, guess who was the last to find out? It is the shepherds. And so this angel comes in, and he says, you will find him. Not the mayor, not the governor, not the social media influencer, not the people who are in the know, not even the religious leaders who have been waiting. No, he's saying, you, the last person on earth to hear about anything amazing, the outcasts, the people on the fringes, the, the stinky people, the people that no one really wants to associate with, you will be the first to be welcomed into the home of the king. The king just moved in the neighborhood, and you're going to be the first one that he hosts in his home. He says, you will go there, and you will find a baby, he says, wrapped in cloths, laying in a manger. How would you respond if you found out that a king just moved into your neighborhood and you're his first guest. Right, I don't know where you live, but imagine if someone came to your door and knocked on your door and you're like, whoa, I've never seen someone like this before. And they're like, yeah, you see all the moving trucks that you just saw over there? Yeah, that's, he's a king, literally like the greatest king in the world, just moved in the neighborhood and is wondering if you'd like to come over for some tea and biscuits and crumpets <laughs> or whatever. And you're like, this is amazing. Right, how would you respond? I don't even know what crumpets are. I just kind of threw that out there. So... Um, that's a thing, right? That you drink with tea? No, does anybody know? No? Nobody knows? Okay, great. None of us know. So let's just pretend it works, right? It's not exhaustive, but there's three responses I want to talk and then we'll sing a song and get out of here. There are three ways that these shepherds responded in this story that I think mirror the way that God wants us to respond to the good news. Again, like I said earlier, it's Christmas. Everybody knows the story. Nobody's like, there's a twist. I didn't see it coming. Sammy, we all know the story, but the question I want you to ask this morning is not, do you know the story or do you know where it's going? The question is, how are you responding to the story? 
Like, what's your response to the story of the good news, the greatest story the world has ever known? The shepherds responded in three ways, and I'm hoping as we look through these three ways, you're going to do a little bit of a heart check, right? You're going to pressure test your heart and your response. And my hope is in the very least that we would have hearts and a posture that respond the way that they responded. There's three things that they did. I'm going to skip down to verse 15. Listen to what he says. So the angel came, told them about Jesus, and he says in verse 15, when the angels left them and went back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and, say it with me, see this thing that has happened which the Lord told us about. So what's the first thing that the shepherds did? They went and saw, right? The angel came and said, here's the deal. Here, here's what's happening. Here's, here's what God's doing. Someone's about to move in. The king just moved in. And their first response is, well, I got to go see for myself. They went and saw because that's what you do when you find out that something amazing is happening right near you. Several weeks ago, we had a board meeting. And, uh, and I don't know how we got into this conversation, but we were talking about this kid who uh, plays for Emmanuel. I, I found out Matt Harsh was talking about it, and he's apparently the number one, is that right, dad, basketball player in the country. I couldn't believe it, right? In, the, in what? Number one freshman, like, in the nation. Like, they're talking about this kid, and I'm like, what's his name? And I was like, I'd never heard of him before. And I'm like, where? Like, Emmanuel? I'm like, are you sure? Like, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, no offense to Emmanuel Baptist, but... I mean, Bebe was at TCS, my oldest daughter, and we played some games, and we went to the games. There's like four people on the stand, you know? I was like, what's going on here? And they're like, no, man, the, the number one freshman in the nation plays at Emmanuel. And they're like, it is crazy, man. It is packed. You can't even get tickets, you know? It's like, it's not quite LeBron, you know, but, but it's up there. Everybody is coming to come see this kid play and so I'm like well I gotta go see this kid play right I want to go see him and next day dad and I were talking and he's like I went home did you say you went home and did all that you were watching like highlights he's watching highlights of this kid on YouTube you know I'm like text it to me and Chris Lurin I don't know if Chris Lurin's here but I get a text like several days later between Chris Lurin and Matt Harsh and I and Chris is like man I'm looking up tickets and we can go and normally when I get a text and there's a green bubble I'm angry like that brings out <laughs> anger and bitterness <laughs> So I'm like, don't do this to me, Chris. Don't put me in this thread I can't leave. This is cruel and unusual punishment. But not this time. This time I was like, okay, I don't mind being in this text because we're talking about going to see this kid. And, and I'm like, is he as good? And they're like, he is phenomenal. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? Anybody know this kid? Some of you go, anybody, is this the first? Zero of hands, it's the first time that you're hearing about this kid. Okay. All right, keep your hand up if you're like, I would go see this kid. Like, I, that sounds amazing. Okay, look at all of you guys, right? Some of you are like, don't care. <laughs> You'd go see him, right, Jared? Number one. That's my man right there. Of course you would. Right? He's the number one freshman in the country. He's at Emmanuel Baptist. <laughs> I'm like, I want to go see. Right? And so we're texting back and forth. Like, can we actually get? And they're like, it's hard to get tickets, man. You got to get tickets way ahead of time because it's box office, right? At Emmanuel. The angel said, there's a baby, a Messiah in Bethlehem. <laughs> and they're like, what? Exactly. <laughs> really? And I love their response. They're like, we got to go see. Right? The writer says they hurried. They ran. They're, they're like, we, we got to go see for ourselves. They went and saw. That was the first response to them hearing about the good news is the shepherds decided that they were going to go for themselves and see because that's what happens when something amazing happens around you. And this is not so much the message, but I wish we made this part of the good news clearer to people who don't believe in Jesus. Okay, I wish this church was more clear about this part of the Christmas story. Okay, I wish we told more people who didn't believe in Jesus that there is an invitation to come and see. Right? I wish we made it more clear that you didn't have to just believe just because your parents said so, just because the pastor said so, just because the church said so, not even just because the Bible said so. I wish we told more people who didn't believe in the story of Jesus that there is an open invitation to come and see for yourselves. Okay, come. 
Right? You're not sure if you believe? That's great. Bring your doubts. Bring your questions. Bring your insecurity. Bring all the things that are mentally, you know, in the way for you. And come. Come and see for yourself. I love the way the psalmist puts it. He says, taste and, oh, this is so good. Woo! He's like, taste and see that the Lord is good. The message paraphrase always got to be extra says this. Open your mouth. I love that. And taste. Open your eyes and see. The good news is not my mom and kind of grew up in church and, you know, we're Christians, you know, the Christian, whatever. No, no, no. No, good news is you come, shepherds. You, you, you get to come and you see for yourselves. Open your mouth, he says, and taste. I know you've driven by. I know you've seen the commercials. I know you've seen the signs. I know maybe you've even watched some videos on YouTube. Maybe you've even been on their website. But at some point, you got to pull off the road into the parking lot. And then you got to get out of your car. And you got to walk in. And then you got to get a box. It's a nice box, I know. <laughs> Maybe the greatest box in the history of the world. I mean, someone, we should just start putting this under trees. Anyone I'm talking about? Like for Christmas? Amen. Anybody with me? I'll take this. You don't even have to wrap it. You know, just put a nice bow on here. And I'm like, it's a great Christmas already. <laughs> but it's not enough to get the box. Right? At some point. You got to get in your car. Some of you can't wait to get in your car, but it's preferable if you get in your car. And then when you get in your car, you got to actually open the box. Some of you are like, I wasn't sure if it was in there. Oh, it's in there. <laughs> it's the goodness of the Lord. I will not withhold any good thing from you guys. I love you guys. You got to open the box. But it's not enough to open the box. It's not enough that you drove by or that you went in the store or that you even got a box and got it in your car. Nah, man. The Krispy Kreme experience. That's a thing, by the way. <laughs> Legit thing. Trust me, I researched it for a long time. The experience demands that you... Throw that verse back up there. Be more dramatic. <laughs> that you open... Open your what? Wow. If anybody wants to testify while I eat, feel free. I'm eating the whole thing. I know I can eat it in one bite, but that would be less dramatic. What was that you said about not envying Hannah? Love doesn't envy, so be happy for me, you guys. <laughs> Can I take a little water break before I finish this last bite? Mm. Is this translating online? You guys let me know. Can you just zoom in for those online? Because I want them to feel this moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Open your mouth, he says. All right? Taste and see. Taste and see. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't buy your head in shame. You can get it. There you go. There you go, bro. There you go. Awesome. Pace is sitting in the front, don't it? You guys in the back. I should have sat in the front. I'm not going back there. Sorry. Okay, you had your chance. There you go. Taste. And see, oh, you got the double. Okay, all right, here, put the blessing back. All right, hey, the Lord wants to give you double. You take double, okay? Taste and see. There you go. Hey, taste and see. Look at these guys. Fist bump. Awesome. Look at you guys. Sorry, guys. I'm not coming way back there. He says, open your mouth, taste, and see. I was reading this verse earlier this week. All joking aside, 
and I just became a complete mess in my office. I just wept because I remember, I'll never forget that day at the guy's house, the house where we got robbed in the hood. I remember the first time that I tasted. Grew up in church my whole life. Heard all the stories, knew all the Sunday school stories, knew all the answers. Checked all the boxes, church, Bible study, read the Bible, memorize verses. I knew all of those things and I had done all of those things. But I will never forget the day and I'm sitting in my room. I can picture it right now just kneeling by my bed. And I remember, and this was a time in my life, you have to understand, where nothing was going well. Nothing was going according to plan. And I remember just falling on my knees just saying, there is nothing better than Jesus. Okay, I didn't have a platform. I wasn't preaching to anybody. I wasn't writing a sermon. I wasn't trying to craft something. No, this was just me in a conversation with God. And I literally said to him, Jesus, there is nothing better than you. I know that my life's not going great right now, but I can't even think of any good thing that could happen to me that will be better than what I am experiencing right now. For the first time in my life, I tasted of the goodness and the grace and the favor of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't because I was a pastor or because I went to church or because I'm a religious person. No, I tasted of the goodness of God and my heart fell in love with Jesus. And I knew in that moment moment that nothing I ever experienced in my life will ever, ever be better than Jesus. Not even the good things. Not marriage, not my kids, not my job, not going on tour, not preaching, not living the dream. Nothing will be greater than experiencing Jesus. He was that good and he was that real. Taste, the writer says, and see that the Lord is good. The first response to the good news is that you got to come and see for yourself. And I'll never forget that day. And I'll never forget the days subsequent to that day. Just this week, and I'm not saying this to brag, I'm just letting you know, man, just this week in my office, I'm in the corner on the floor, I turn the lights off, hopefully no one sees me. And I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm like, God is just so good. He's so good. That wasn't like sermon notes or like, no, 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 there was no cue. There was nobody there. It was me just going, man, this is so, you are so good. Because I tasted. What about you? Have you tasted and seen? When was the last time you tasted if you're in the room or online and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, usually we save this stuff to the very end, but forget that, man. If you've never come and seen, if you've never tasted, you can step into that moment right now. Like right now, you can literally step into the moment. And I invite you to. There's a prayer we ask people to pray every Sunday towards the end usually, but I'm going to throw it in the middle today. Jesus, I believe and I give you my life. It's not the only conversation you need to have to God, but it's the beginning. And if you've never prayed that prayer, if you've never come and seen, if, if all of this, as far as you could tell, was just church and religion and culture and being good and rules and all of that stuff, man, this is more than that. God's saying, I need you to pull off, man. Get out of the car. Grab a box. Open it. Open your mouth and taste. Come with all of your doubts. Come with all of your questions. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus, I believe, give me my life. If you pray that prayer by faith, then Jesus promises that he will meet you where you are. You guys still with me? Three responses. They came and saw. We got Krispy Kremes for everybody, by the way. On your way out, there will be boxes out there. <laughs> yeah, you can clap. <laughs> Some of you are like, you really going to do me like that, bro? Just because I didn't sit in front, I didn't get no creams. No, we got Krispy Kremes for everybody. And so on your way out, don't just walk by, okay? Don't just look at the box. Grab one, open your mouth, and taste. If you're like, Sandy, I'm counting your calories. The grace of God covers that today. 
there is a special grace this morning. The Lord's like, just don't worry about that 19,700 calories that you're about to eat. Listen to what he says in verse 16. It says, so they hurried off, right, and they found Mary, right, and Joseph. And it says, and the baby was laying in the manger like they had been told. And then listen to the second thing he says. It says, when they had seen him, so they went and saw. And then it says, when they saw him, then what they do? They spread the word. Somebody say spread. 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 They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. I think that's so interesting. Because, again, these guys were, like, at the bottom of the totem pole. So, yeah, I don't know if they had social media back in the first century. But if they did, the shepherds probably had, like, two followers, okay? <laughs> mom and their other account they created. So they had more followers than mom. You know what I'm talking about? Like, they, nobody was following the shepherd. So I'm like, how'd they, how'd they do it, man? I mean, these guys didn't have social influence. But yet, he says, they spread. So how did they respond to the good news? They went and saw. And the second response is they went and told. So they went and saw, and when they saw, and when they tasted, they went and told, because that's the natural response when you see something amazing. When you hear something amazing, you're like, I got to go see it. And then when you see it and experience it, what do you do? You tell somebody, right? About a month and a half ago, and I posted this on Instagram last night, I took my girls to the American, two of my girls to the American girls store, right? And it was incredible. Like, they bought all this stuff, and... And that was painful, but everything else was amazing. <laughs> and I had to call my, you know, financial person at the American Girl Store, like, can I mortgage, take a second mortgage on the house to be able to buy this dog? This is a whole different thing. But anyways, so we, we get the girls, and we're coming back home, and, and I'm driving them back home. And, and, and they're talking about how they're like, man, oh, we can't, we can't wait to go to school tomorrow, right? We can't wait to go to school tomorrow. We can't wait to go tell everybody about what happened. I think you got my cue wrong, bro. Sound of music. Remember? Not quite yet. We got a lot of time. I mean, you can stand back there and play. I'd love to have background music, but I just don't want to make it awkward for you. So everyone say hi, Taylor. Thank you, Taylor, for that. That was great. That was a great time to do it because I'm like, I'm just telling the story. I'm like, he's going back there. It's a little early, right? But the whole way back, my girls were like, I can't wait to tell my friends. They're like, I can't wait to tell people. They're like, I can't wait, they said, to tell my teacher. And I promise I'm not making this up. My kids, and I didn't, I, I didn't even ask them to, they made a PowerPoint presentation for their friends. <laughs> this is true. My, am I lying, babe? My wife's right there. Literally, they, they're like, we went to school, we made a PowerPoint presentation, and we showed it to our teacher, and we made everybody watch it. <laughs> I was like, that's next level. Right, I feel like I, should, I need to get some, like, royalties from, like, American Girl Store. These are, I'm, I'm raising American Girl Store evangelists right here, right? I mean, they're showing PowerPoints with their friends. But that's what you do when you experience something amazing, right? You tell about it. It's normal to tell about it. When you eat somewhere and it's amazing, you're like, oh, man, Sammy's going to talk about QQ again. Yes, he is. <laughs> Not because they sponsor me. Even though, Josh, if you're watching, I told you I'll wear a QQ shirt every Sunday, okay? I'll do a little sponsor thing for Free Hunan for Life, right? But that's not why I talk about it, right? It's the same thing when you see a good movie, right? When you go to a great concert, when you hear a song that you love, it is normal and natural for you to tell people about it. And so what did the shepherds do when they heard about the good news? The first thing they did is they went and saw, and then they went and told Right? They just kept going around and they spread the word to as many people as possible because it is normal for you to tell people about something amazing that you experienced. Can I ask you guys a question that bothers me about myself in some ways? Why is it, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, if you're not, you can take a pass from this, but why is it? That we will be excited to talk about everything except for Jesus. Right? And, and don't worry, this is not one of those sermons. I grew up in church, and I know the sermons that makes everyone uncomfortable. I hate it whenever they talk about evangelism. You're like, oh, gosh, man. You might as well just, like, punch me in the face right now. I know I should do it, and I don't like it. No, this is not one of those sermons. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about anything. I'm just saying, is it not normal in every other area of our lives that when we eat good food, go to a good restaurant, see a good movie, go to a good concert, read a good book, that we naturally tell people about it. So why is it that that doesn't translate to the good news of Jesus Christ? 
Why is it that so many of us are so reluctant? Why is it that we're so hesitant? Why is it that when we hear stories of guys like Greg Hart, I don't know if he's in the back, who goes every week literally to knock on doors to tell people about the good news, our response, and we may not say this out loud, but on the inside we're going, that's kind of weird. Man, Greg, that guy is courageous. Why, why is that? Okay, and I'm not saying, don't miss the point, I'm not saying that we all need to go like start knocking on doors. No, what I'm saying though is that if the gospel is as good news as we say it is, what Greg does is far more normal than what we do. Right? What I'm suggesting is something is off. When you say, I have experienced, again, I'm not just talking like, you know, I go to church or whatever. No, no. If you say that I have actually tasted, okay, I've experienced the good news. I've met Jesus and he changed my life. He is the best friend I've ever heard. Like we just sang, his love never fails. If you say that I truly believe that in my heart of hearts something is off if there's not at least a little fire inside of you that compels you to want to tell somebody about it right there's got to be something inside of you like I gotta I gotta do what the shepherds did I gotta spread the news it's the greatest news the world has ever known and I don't want to oversimplify the conversation but if if that's not there if that, that, that fire is not there then either we haven't tasted Oh, we haven't tasted in a while. Oh, we've forgotten how good the good news is. Oh, we've bought into the lie that is someone else's job. Interesting, isn't it, that the shepherd's response was not, oh, man, I sure hope the angel goes and tells everybody. <laughs> That's what I would have said. Thank you, Mr. Angel, for coming back to my house and telling me. Hope you got enough time to hit the town. <laughs> Because that's your job. That's the pastor's job. That's Greg's job. No, they're like, we're going to tell everybody that we can tell. And I love it in verse 18. Listen to what the writer says. It says, all who heard it were amazed. All. The message said they were impressed. Ladies and gentlemen, I would love to propose for your consideration this morning. That if we... Do what they did, and we do it how they did it. If you spread the good news of the gospel, and you do it in a way that we've been talking about in this series, you do it with kindness, and you do it with patience, without envy. If you are humble, I would love to propose for you this morning that most, if not all, the people you talk to will be impressed. I'm not saying they're all going to believe, but I promise you they will not respond the way you think they'll respond. I'll never forget when I did college ministry, and, and we did this like, I'm not exaggerating, maybe like, I don't know, 50, 60 times at UT. Like, we would go on the University of Toledo's campus in the winter, like, like it's like negative five degrees, you know, which, you know, for me is like, I mean, that's like, that's like, I don't even know, that's like the worst case scenario, right? I'm like, I'm done, right? But I went out there because I cared about people, right, <laughs> you know. And we would wear these backpacks with hot chocolate, and we would give people free hot chocolate as they would go into their classes. Like, they're free, and we're like, hey, free hot chocolate. And like, thanks. And almost everybody would say, why, why are you giving away free hot chocolate? And we said the same thing every time. Oh, we're just showing God's love in a practical way. Thank you. Have a good day. We're just showing God's love. Why are, you, why are you guys doing this? It's cold. Oh, we just want to show you God's love in a practical way. I promise you guys, we served hundreds of people. Not one time did somebody say, forget you and your hot chocolate and God's love and threw it on the floor. <laughs> Not once on a secular campus. Right? The worst response we got was, huh, thanks. <laughs> That's it. Like, and I would tell people all the time, Anybody can do this. Like we, we, didn't like, we didn't hide it. We're like, hey, we're a Christian organization. We just wanted to show you God's love in a tangible way. And almost everybody was like, wow, thank you. Why is that? Because at some capacity, at some level, we all want the good news to be true. And so if we feel, if we believe that the good news is actually as good as we say that it is, then there ought to be a part of us that not only is compelled to tell people, but we have to believe that it's good enough that people will actually want it. And so the angels weren't like, oh, man, I don't know. They're just like, man, I'm a, I just saw something amazing. I can't wait. 
the palace. So how did they respond? They went and saw. And then what did they do? They went and they told. They went and they told. It's not enough to come and see. You got to go. Right? It's a song that we just sang. Go and tell it on the mountains. And you're like, but Sammy, there's no mountains in Toledo. <laughs> there's a mommy. Right? There's Whitmer, Toledo Public, Sylvania, your neighborhood, where you live, where you work. Go and tell people that somebody moved in the neighborhood. He's about to change everything. In his name. Verse 19 in closing says that Mary treasured up all these things in her heart, pondered them in her heart, and then it says in verse 20, and this is the last response, it says the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. So they went and saw, they went and told, and last but not least, they went and praised God. Because worship and praise is a soundtrack of grace. So they went and saw, and they went and told, and as they went back, they worshiped and praised God. Because worship is a soundtrack of grace. I was reading this over and over this week, and I just thought to myself, you know what? If someone made Luke chapter 1 and 2, I don't know if you ever thought about this before, into a motion picture, it would be a musical. Any musical fans in here? I love musicals. Right? I love, like, I don't know if it's because I grew up. If you don't like musicals, we can't be friends. Like, I don't know if it's, I mean, we can be because of God and his grace and all that stuff. But, you know, without that, I don't know if I want to be your friend. But anyways, I grew up watching musicals. Right? I love musicals. King and I, anybody? King and I? Right? Seven Brides with Seven Brothers. Like, I'm talking like, yes. Anybody? Wow, I didn't know a lot of people that knew that movie. I could sing every song in that movie. Mary Poppins. The Goat. The Sound of Music. Anybody? There's your cue, Taylor. Taylor's like, I'm not going to miss that one. <laughs> the sound of music. Every single one of our kids. I mean, they haven't seen the movie, but, you know, I worked Joe Deer into, like, their nighttime thing. <laughs> or I actually had all these spiritual songs, like, worthy is your name, holy is the Lord. I'm like, Joe, a deer, a female <laughs> deer, Ray, a drop of golden sun. Anybody? Me, a name, I call. Far, a long, long way to run. So, you guys sound great. La, we're almost there. T, that will bring us back to, no. give yourselves a hand. Come on now. Woo, that's so good. That's church right there. <laughs> Christmas Story is a musical. Can I show you? I don't have time to read it, but check it when you get home. Luke chapter 1 begins the context for the Christmas story. There's a prophet named Zechariah, and God gives him the promise that a Savior was going to be born. And then the writer introduces us to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you ready for this? In Luke chapter 1, for 10 verses, Mary is singing a song. Do you guys know this? Like there's 10 verses in Luke chapter 1. Where she's just singing. And then there's a few more words. And then the prophet Zechariah comes in. And he's like, I got, I'm gonna, I got to one off that one. He sings for 13 verses. So Mary got 10. He's like, you know, like they're like, wow, this is amazing. That's the most singing we've ever heard. And he's like, hold my beer. Watch this, right? <laughs> he sings for 13 verses. And then you get in Luke chapter 2. Angel appears. I didn't read this part. We're going to read it on Christmas Eve. It's one of my favorite parts of Luke chapter 2. The angels tell the shepherds that a Savior has been, burned, has been born. And it says all of a sudden, I think it's in verse, I don't know, what verse is it? Verse 13. It says, suddenly a great company of angels just appeared and they started praising God. So Luke chapter 1, Mary sings. Zachariah sings. Luke chapter 2, angel talks. Bunch of angels are singing. Shepherds talk. Shepherds are singing musical <laughs> right they're singing in every step and the reason they're singing is not the same reason why we were just singing to it's not the same reason why they sang in Mary Poppins the reason they were singing is because 
Singing and praising is the soundtrack to grace. The reason they were singing is because the baby was worthy of praise. Love the way Matthew put it. Just in closing, listen to what Matthew says. In Matthew chapter 2, talking about the wise men when they came. Right, he says they entered the house. It's a different account, right? God told them they were coming. He says they saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. So these are the, the wise men. They saw the child. They followed the star. They came. And he says, overcame. They kneeled and worshipped him. So think about this for a second. These are grown men showed up. And he says that when they saw the baby, baby Jesus, the king who just moved in the neighborhood, the writer says that they were so overcome by what they saw that they knelt and they did what the shepherds did and what the angels did and what Mary did and what Zachariah did at the announcement of the good news. They came on their knees and they worshipped him. They worshipped him because he was worthy of praise. They didn't sing because they had to. They didn't sing because it's that time of the service where we get to sing. Now, no. They worshiped them because the baby is the king of the universe. He was actually worthy of all of their praise. They were overcome by the weight of the good news, by the good news of the peace of God and the favor of God and the joy of God, that God would no longer treat us the way that we deserve, that God actually sent his son to move into the neighborhood, that God actually wanted to be their friend, that this was the day that they've been waiting for for 400 years, and now a Messiah, a Savior has been born for them. They were over overwhelmed and the only response they had was worship all through the story you see this they came and saw they went and told but it wasn't enough to see and it wasn't enough to tell at some point the good news is going to lead you to this position if the good news is as good as we say that it is, at some point you got to get here. Okay, my prayer for our community in the room and online is that this Christmas season, at some point you get to this place. Okay, it may be the day after Christmas. It may be on Christmas Eve in our service. It may be on your drive in. It may be on your drive out. It may be in a few days. It may be tomorrow. In a couple hours. It may be this moment right now you got to get to this place where you are overcome by the king. And the only thing you can do is just worship him. I got nothing else but to lift a shout of praise, to lift my hands, to lift my heart, because you are worthy of of my life. He says they went and they praised and they glorified God. You're worthy of my praise. 